Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back for 2015 after our holiday break. This is Dan and Matt back with the newest episode of Fireside Chat. This is our Marilyn Mew episode, episode 66. Happy New Year. How are you doing, Matt? Good. Happy New Year. It's our third year now. I know. We started right after the last lockout. We started in January right after the last lockout, and we're still going strong. It's getting to be a lot more fun as we go on, especially with a great team like this. And thanks to everyone who listens, because without you guys, we wouldn't keep doing this. So, Matt, we uh, last talked when the Flames were on a bit of a losing skid, and ever since we stopped broadcasting for the holiday season, the Flames have really turned themselves around. We talked last on the 22nd, just before the Kings game, and they went on a four-game win streak uh, at that point. We had a 4-3 win over the Kings, then on the 27th we beat the Oilers, beat the Kings again, and then beat the Oilers again. So four wins in a row there. And just this past Friday, the Flames lost 2-1 to to the Islanders, uh, do you think that we've got everything back on track? Yeah, by and large. It, they're getting bounces again, and they're playing a lot more cohesively. That was one of the main problems that during the eight-game losing streak, and even the last couple of wins prior to that streak, they were getting a little uncoordinated with each other. So it's nice to see that they're putting things back together. When I watched the games um, over the holidays, I felt like the Oilers games were pretty much a confidence booster for the team. They seemed like they went out there, they played good hockey, and they were really able to get themselves back in the groove against the Oilers. Yeah, it's actually interesting how different the Oilers were in the first game versus the New Year's Eve game. Yeah, very true. When d- it was like it was like playing two different teams. <laughs> yeah, it was. The first time the Oilers, uh, to me anyways, the first game, the Oilers really didn't even seem like they turned on the Jets by the end of the game. They seemed like they were surprised that we came to play hockey. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why the Oilers are where they are in the standings. That's true. But at least since uh, Nelson has taken over as their coach, they seem to be playing a lot more cohesive overall and like in that new year's eve game like they were breaking into the zone properly and all that so something that's been lacking yeah it was good to see i guess that the oilers are at least in that game looked like they were putting something together yeah it's nice for their fans at least to have hockey being played instead of whatever it's been for (laughs) how many years yeah no that's true and then the last game, the Flames took on the Islanders. Um, I thought that was a weird game for the Flames. I don't know how you felt about it, but I just felt like neither team was really getting the bounces. I felt like the Flames were getting some good chances in the zone and getting stoned by Halak. But I just I watched the whole game. I was there at the Dome, and it just seemed like the Flames were not getting lucky. I guess that's the best way to put it. Well, the thing is, is that you have to give... Uh... Props to the Islanders for being as good defensively as they were. Like, every time the Flames tried to make a pass, they would seem to always have a stick in the lane properly to deflect it. Or if a guy's taking a point shot, they'd get in front of it and block it. So, you know, it it was good to see that the Islanders as well are doing good. You know, because it's been, what, 30 years since they've been relevant? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I've seen the Islanders just kind of on an upward trajectory over the last couple of years. Um, ever since Tavares came in, to me, they seem like they've actually had a system they've been trying to put in place since then. Oh, yeah. It's just good to see them finally putting the pieces together, finally, and being one of the top teams in the East. I think that watching that game against the Islanders, too, the Flames really seem like they got caught out quickly against the Islanders. The first period, the Isle were all over us in the zone. And I think it was good to see the Flames able to kind of regroup and come back from that as opposed to maybe get too defensive and just kind of shut down, which we've seen a little bit as well. Exactly. Actually, the Islanders remind me a lot of how the Flames are. It's just that they have a little bit more 
developed talent. Yeah, if you look at the Islanders roster, I mean, there's a lot of decent NHL players there. You got guys like Grabowski, Kuhleman, Okposo, Boychuk. So I think they are what the Flames could be in a couple of years. Yeah. Well, Matt, it's 2015, um, a new year. And as we know, in the new year, people often like to make uh, predictions and resolutions about things. Why don't we talk a little bit about what the Flames need to do in 2015 in order to remain successful. At the time we record this, we're ninth in the West, tied with San Jose for eighth, but they have a, an extra game to play, so we've dropped down to ninth. Uh, why don't we start with you? Do you have any predictions for 2015 or things you think the Flames need to do to uh, stay successful? The Flames, in my mind, to stay successful, they just need to stay the course, and even though the Flames are close to a playoff spot, I would actually prefer they still continue to sell as if we were in 13th. And, you know, like, if you look on the farm, we got guys like Poirier, Berchi, and a few others that are ready to go if, say, we trade a guy like Glenn Cross. So, you know, just keep down that path and see where it goes in recent years we've seen teams like the sharks where they've traded off guys for draft picks and actually continue to play well and make the playoffs even though they were on the bubble anyway well if you look at the flames team the main drivers of the team are mostly the younger players anyway so if you have to get rid of a veteran for draft picks or prospects at least we have more young players that can be fed into the system i went back and listened to some of our episodes from the beginning of the year back in training camp and that sort of era where we were talking about what we we're predicting for this year and a couple of things i thought were interesting is we were expecting a lot of flames to wear a flaming sea this year and i think we can arguably say that's happened. Not so much on the defensive side, but we've had a lot of forwards who have worn a flaming C this year. And I think that we have seen what we wanted to see, which was some of the young players make a claim for a roster spot. We talked back during training camp about, you know, Setaguchi making the roster and how his spot was probably there for the young guys say, you have to be better than this to make the roster, which I think we have seen. I mean, Setaguchi is now an Adirondack. And Juris is still up here. Um, you know, some of the young players are sticking around longer than I think we expected them to. I agree with you. I think they need to stay the course. I think the main thing right now is development, developing both the younger players, but also I think taking some of the players that are maybe veterans on this team, some of the guys that have been around the league for a while, and helping them develop maybe to the next level. I think we've seen some really good seasons from guys we weren't expecting to this year, namely David Jones comes to mind. Um, I think even Lance Buma's had a good season. So I think that if the Flames stay the course, don't worry about the playoffs. Don't worry about the score. I mean, sounds bad to say, but don't worry about the score of every game from here on in. Just worry about playing the best game and developing. I think we're going to have a great 2015. We've had an unbelievable first half of the year. And I think that it's going to be tough to keep up the momentum they've had, but I think that we can still have a great season. Yeah, and like if you look at the their record for 2014, they actually finished the calendar year with 88 points, which for a team that was supposed to be in the doldrums of a rebuild, 88 points... You know, like, the Stars last year only had 90 to get into the playoffs. So, you know, they're close. It's just, you got to wait and see. So looking now that we're in January, looking ahead to the end of the season, what would you define now at the half, I guess, let's say this is about the halfway point. We're just over half the games played. But what would you define as a success metric? If we were to look back in April and say the Flames were successful or not successful this year, how would you judge that? Honestly, I would judge that based off of the performance of the young players. Like, if the Flames make the playoffs, that's amazing, awesome, great. But that shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. Like, I don't want to see the Flames go out and acquire a couple of rentals just because, oh, we might make the playoffs. That would be kind of shooting yourself in the foot in the long term. 
if guys like Juris and Gaudreau and whomever else comes up performs well, and if the guys in Adirondack have a successful season, that's all that should matter. And, like, this year was basically more or less irrelevant for the Calgary Flames, not so much the Adirondack Flames. And they've surprised, and that's good, but as long as they keep doing the things right and keep learning and keep improving, that's the important thing. Yeah, I think if I were to look at a maybe it's something that's measurable of improvement, to me I think one of the things we could look at is how many of the call-up players are still wearing a Flames jersey come closing day of the season. Do you think that would be fair to look at? Yeah, and I could see three or four guys at the end of the year sticking around. And then to me, those guys would have to make the team again next year as well. Oh yeah, exactly. No spot is, you know, yours permanently. No. Look at Sven Berchi. Like, he, he made the team last year out of camp and didn't this year. Yeah, and I mean, we tend to play a lot of young players at the end of the year, so just because you're wearing a C at the end doesn't mean, you know, you're going to the next year. I mean, you know, Juris is a great example. But I think if we've got guys like Juris, Goudreau, um, even a guy like Joe Colborn, who are improving and we're seeing better numbers from this year, I, I definitely think that that is a success. You're right about the playoffs. We are not a team coming in this year who needed a playoff spot. We aren't a team that was promising fans a playoff spot. The Flames have famously been saying, hey, we're not a playoff team. Yeah, so like if they do actually surprise and get in, that's like found money. Like that's just a bonus. It's icing on the cake. It's like an 04. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that'll be a good learning experience for the young players as well if they do actually make it. If not, they get to see what it takes to actually elevate them to make the playoffs. For sure. And, you know, we talked about this late in the year. I still have mixed feelings about if the playoffs are necessarily going to change the course of the future but I agree with you as well that I don't want to see the Flames go out and get a bunch of rental players I think as soon as we start trading assets for rentals it shows that they've kind of become overcome by I don't want to say greed but I guess overcome by the prospect of making some money there in the playoffs and I think that's when we really start to derail the rebuild yeah like they need to stay the course regardless and the good thing is is that like especially in the draft there are quite a number of good defensemen this year. So, like, if you keep going and just keep adding the pieces that you need to organizationally, that's a good thing. In the offseason, if you want to go get a good number three guy, you know, whomever that would be, that would be a good thing. But to do so now would be kind of detrimental unless you got the player for a song. Yeah, and I, you know, I still, I mean, we haven't really seen the Flames make a trade in the, um, in the true living era, so I, I think that there's still something yet to be done there. I don't think they're going to go all season without doing something, but I'm not expecting anything huge coming back. I'm expecting we might see some fairly big name pieces leaving, namely Glenn Cross. Yeah, I could even see Weidman going in the right scenario as well. It everything depends, though. For sure. Um, let me ask you this. If we look at 2015 as a whole year, not just this half of the hockey season, but if we, say, talk about December 31st of 2015, do you think that we still have the same front office at the end of this calendar year that we do now? I don't see why not. I don't see a reason not to either. I think Brian Burke's a great leader. I think, again, without seeing a great body of work, I think that uh, Trill Living is proving to be a good GM so far. The fact that he was kind of this no-name guy to most fans and won the job tells me that there's you know something there. Um, but I agree with you. I think that if we look at next year, we will see Hartley back. We know that. We'll see you know his coaching staff for the most part back, maybe a change to one or two coaches. I think the whole front office comes back. I don't think that we're at risk to change that again, which it seems like we, every year we make a change there somewhere. So it'll be nice to have some stability. Yeah, and they've done a good enough job that they there shouldn't be any changes immediately. Like it, arguably, like when Feaster got fired, there was enough of a body of work of trades that we didn't quite get enough of, and all that kind of stuff. That 
you know, you could make a change without, you know, just firing the guy for no reason. Well, yeah, and I think when Feaster was fired too, it was a bit different because now we had Brian Burke in town. It's not like we're just firing Feaster and going, okay, we fired him and now we got to go find somebody. I think that it was kind of a, okay, Burke is out of here, but we have the team still in good hands. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I think that even if, let's say, part of next season or the end of this season gets a little bit rocky with the front office, I think these guys have earned the right to stay in perhaps a bit longer. I mean, if you look at what they've done so far, I think that they've earned the right to get another look to maybe, you know, get another chance. And arguably, I don't think Feaster did. Yeah. And, you know, you got to roll with these guys until something's wrong. And nothing's going wrong right now. So let it rip. So another prediction. um, If we look at players who we don't think will be wearing a Flames jersey by the end of this season. You mentioned Glenn Cross earlier. We mentioned Weidman. Anyone else who you think the Flames uh, might be moving this season? I could see Ladislav Smead in the right scenario. I don't think you would trade Weidman and Smead, but if somebody really likes him, I could see Smead going. I could also see a couple of our depth-ish forwards going. Um, possibly even Michael Backlund. There's a trade to be made for a good defenseman and a team really likes Backlund. Maybe that's how that breaks down. Who knows? I'll agree with you on, uh, I'll agree with you maybe on Weidman. Um, I think Glenn Cross for sure. I'm not sure about Backlund, perhaps. One guy, whether it's through trade or something else, one guy I don't think we will see in a Flames jersey for sure by the end of this se- or by the start of next season, I guess, is Brian McGratton. Oh, yeah. I think his days I are not. I forgot numbered. about him, yeah. Big Earn has not played many games this year. He's really been usurped as the tough guy in the lineup by Bowleg. He's played, what, eight games so far. So what? I don't think you're going to get much for him in a trade. He might be a toss-in somewhere, but... I think that he will not be a flame come, you know, next season. No. And, yeah, I'd like him to stay around in some capacity, but, you know, whatever. It It's one of those things that who knows exactly what will happen with him. You know, he is 33 now, so I could see him deciding that, you know what, he's getting too old to go somewhere else and keep fighting. Maybe he just packs it in and, you know, becomes part of the Flames alumni here in town. Yeah, I could see that. That's. I think that his days in the NHL are probably numbered. I don't think there's a lot of teams that would probably go out and acquire him after this. It seems like the real tough guy fighter role has gone by the wayside. So I think it would either be playing in a lower level league, playing in Europe, or hanging up the skates. Yeah, well, with the Canucks uh, waving Sestito last week, uh, I think the heavyweight guy is pretty much done in the NHL. I think the NHL's getting geared up to eliminate fighting entirely. Yeah, which I think it would be interesting if they do, because it's always been said that that's what kept the Americans watching. So I would be okay if we got rid of the fighting. Really, the Flames, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we haven't seen a lot of Flames fighting this year. It seems like this is probably the year with the least amount of fights that I can think of. Yeah, I think there's only been like six or seven all year or something Yeah, I was like going to say about eight. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I haven't missed it at all. And, you know, it's one thing, like, if you're, say, fighting in front of the net for positioning and, you you know, you get cross-checked in the back and a fight erupts from something like that. But, you know, oh, you want to go? Okay, let's drop the gloves. That's kind of annoying. Yeah, I mean, I've never been a fan of fighting in hockey to start with. But I agree with you. If there's going to be a fight, I want it to come out of passion. You know, you take down someone like Goudreau, so somebody goes and takes you out. Or, yeah, it gets chipped in front of the net and two guys drop the gloves. But I hate the stage fights, the two guys who line up and decide, hey, we're just going to drop the gloves and fight for entertainment. Yeah. Or to fire up the bench or anything like that. Like, find another way to spark your team. Score a goal throw a big hit something yeah no i agree with you and i think we'll never entirely eliminate fighting because it is a physical game and there are those emotions but i'd be totally fine if they eliminate the staged fighting 
Well, they fight in baseball, so, like, come on. You're not going to eliminate it entirely. <laughs> no, that's true. And, you know, I mean, knowing how the NHL does their rules, generally if they're going to put in a new rule, they try it in the AHL. And there's been no changes to the AHL fighting rules, so I think we're at least a couple years out from anything formally being changed. But, you know, the coaches might almost have a handshake agreement saying, guys, we're not going to, you know, play that tough guy role anymore. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. And plus, I'm sure the NHL wants to try and get away from the liability factor of concussions and all that. Well, in the States, too, I haven't followed them all, but I know we're seeing a lot more talk of, like you said, concussions and lawsuits coming from that. I know there's some NFL players that are filing a lawsuit. So, yeah, it could just be a business decision, too. Fighting might be bad business in 2015. Yeah. Well, talking about uh, Flames that are doing well and what the success metric is for this year, I found it online today, and I thought it was kind of interesting, that we have a handful of guys who are on pace for career years this year. And for a team that wasn't expected to do much this season, I think it's really good that we have so many guys who are on pace for career years. Oh, yeah. And that's a major part of the Flames' success this year, is getting unexpected top performances from guys. Yeah, and, and some of these guys are guys you wouldn't expect to be on a you know a career year either. So I figured I'd run through some of these quickly for everybody. Yari Hoodler's on pace at a career high in points this year. If he keeps going at his current pace, he's going to have 74 points, and his career high is 57. And that was you know a year that he was with a powerhouse Red Wings team. So it would be really nice if he gets 74. I think that would probably bring Hoodler kind of back into the discussion as a top three, maybe top four, five uh, forward for this team going forward. What do you think? Oh, I agree. And I think if uh, he wants to re-sign after his contract's done, that I believe at the end of next year, I'd be all for that. Yeah, and I know a lot of people said, well, he's not the guy we need going forward and that sort of thing. But I think even if he's getting you know a 74-point year or close to that, if he can get you know better than 60... I think that he's earned himself another shot if he wants it. Yeah, like if you signed him, say, to like a three-year extension for like, say, $6 million or something like that, you know, for a top and second line forward or a average first line guy, like that's a fairly good production. And the Flames need to have a player like that in the lineup. Because if they lose him, then they got to go out and find somebody to replace him. And we might not have all the prospects in the world to fill that. And I think even if you look at the role he played with the Red Wings, he was never really the top winger there, but he was always a 2-3 line winger who you knew would have a solid game almost every night. And I think even if he's the top guy here while we're rebuilding... There's definitely a spot for him in a similar role as Calgary, you know, starts to move towards being a playoff and a Stanley Cup contending team is being kind of your middle depth guy who can be solid, can play with almost anybody and still put up a lot of points. I agree. I think one of the biggest success stories, no question this year, is TJ Brody. He already has a career high in goals. He's got six goals and 19 points so far. He's got 25 points overall and his career high is 31. So... I think he's on pace to blow that away, no problem. I think he could easily get into the 40s. Yeah, and the last couple of years, he's been focusing more so on his defensive game and trying to get good at playing defense. When he was first drafted, he was basically just a forward that was on the blue line. And so his offensive game was always there, and now he's finding the right balance between being a good defensive defenseman and a good offensive defenseman yeah I think you're if there's one player that I think you could give kind of the most improved trophy to if there was one this year it would probably be Brody he seems like the player who we've seen the most at least in my mind probably on this roster the most improvement from where they were last year and he's really rounded out to be a quality defenseman on you know the defensive side and the offensive side and we've, I mean, we've seen him eat up first line minutes this year. Yeah, and he hasn't ha had a perfect season. Like he has had some down points, and that's expected from a young defenseman too. 
Yeah, but those down points don't extend out to like five games, six games, ten games, two months. You know, it's like a couple games here and there that he might be a little less than he normally is. And then he returns back to being as good as he's been. So, it's good. And you know, every day that goes by, every game I watch Brody play, I keep thinking to myself, wow, we got a steal of a deal in that contract. Yeah, uh, especially, you know, six years or whatever, at three and a half or whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a guy that's going to be wearing a flaming sea for a long time if we want him to. Mm -hmm. That contract will look like Curtis Glencross's one that's about to expire at the end of the year. Yeah, it will. And I, I hope that we're not in the last year of Brody's deal where we are with Glenn Crosses of saying, okay, this guy's got to leave town. But even if we are, I mean, it's going to be a, a li- it's going to be a number that's not going to be a liability for us at the end. Well, Nikitin's making, what, $5 million for Edmonton? So, you know, that's $4 million's no big deal as long as he's an NHL defenseman. Yeah, no, that's probably true. And I think there's going to be enough upside there, too, that if we have the right GM in place and we need to, um, as much as I'd hate to see it, you can always flip him for an asset before he you know, dips too far. Oh, yeah. And that's not to say that he's going to drop at all. So No, I don't think he will. But Yeah, in worst case scenario, you can always get something. Yeah, exactly. And another guy who's on point for a career year is Brody's uh, defensive partner, Mark Giordano. He's on a career uh, on pace at a career high in goals and in points. He has 35 points thus far, and his career high was 47, which he set last year. How high do you think we can expect Gio to go this year? I'm hoping for in the 50s. I don't. He's slowed down quite a bit recently. He's not been putting up that many points at least in the last handful of games, but he's going to win the Norris Trophy. So, you know, he's the main reason why the Flames are even remotely close to a playoff spot right now. No, I, I think you're right. He's a shoe in for the Norris this year. It'll be nice to have a Flames defenseman win the Norris Trophy again. I would be happy if he can get even to the mid-40s. I think if he can get to 45, even if he can tie last year, I'll be very happy. I think that'll be good. That's, what, 10 more points and the rest of the season so i think you know even if he's slowing down he can do that and tie what he did last year oh yeah that i wouldn't be shocked if he got that by game 60 i would love to see him get 50 or even 60 points this year another guy that i'm surprised to see on this list a guy that i wouldn't expect to be having a career year so far is lance boma uh currently is at six goals and 10 points his career high is 15 points and I think there's probably no doubt that he's going to shatter that. I think he'll definitely get six points for the remainder of the season, which is what he needs to to beat his career high. I have to say that a couple of years ago, I didn't really see Boma as being the bona fide NHL he's become. I thought he'd kind of be a first call-up guy, maybe even a guy that the Flames wouldn't renew. But when he made the team a couple of years ago full-time, he's really, I think, cemented his place as a bottom six forward. Actually, I think he's developed into a core player on this team, even really? though he's a bottom six forward. He does everything that you need a good fourth line player to do. He hits, he blocks shots, he kills penalties. There's not much more you can ask for that. Yeah, no, that's true. And because of that, I think he's the kind of guy who will always probably be a you know bottom six guy, but not a bottom six guy who's going to be one of the interchangeable pieces. We see some of these guys that are on a new team every year. I think he will be a heart and soul guy for the Flames going forward. But yeah, I agree with you. I think that he's kind of become part of the core of this team. Yeah, and his uh, efforts out there, like I remember a few times this year where he'll block like three or four shots on a penalty kill and that'll spark the team because, wow, he actually put his body out on the line for to keep the puck out of the net. It's sparked the Flames on to win those games. So, you know, it, there's not always... You don't always need to score a goal, per se, to be a key contributor on a team. And what Boma does is he brings the energy that the Flames need. I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier with fighting, too. Of This is a guy who can spark his bench, who can get his you know teammates fired up without dropping the gloves. 
Yeah, I don't even think he's had a fight this year. Might have had one, but, you know, that's not the key to his game. And he hits people left, right, and center, and he just does everything well. And it's something the Flames have lacked since Brandon Prest got traded twice. I was about to say, he fills the role that I think Brandon Prust could have here, but we never gave him really the chance to do so. But yeah, good to, good to see that he's on pace for a, for a career year. I think there's no no doubt that he'll probably get um, six, six more points, which is what he needs to beat his career total. And, you know, good for a bottom six guy, um, I think especially a fourth line guy, to even be getting, you know, 15, 16 points during the year. Well, even 10 points for a fourth liner is actually somewhat above average. Yeah, no, you're probably right. I haven't done the research, but yeah, you're probably right. Um, and, and I think that he, I mean, he's 24. So I think as much as we're looking at the future of this team as the Juris and the Reinhardt and that sort of thing, I do think that Booma, Lance Boom is going to be a big part of this team going forward. Yeah. Not, that's the thing with all these prospects coming up is we don't need everybody to be a top line forward. We need players that are good second, third and fourth line guys as well. And like a guy like Hunter Smith, he's a guy that seems destined to be a good, solid third, fourth line guy. But you need that. And, like, if you look at Edmonton, they only draft guys that are, like, top line forwards and they have no middle of their lineup depth at all. And that's part of the reason why they haven't been successful. Yeah, and I mean, we've talked about this throughout, you know, the podcast this year and last year of, yeah, not everybody can be your top three or your top six forwards. You do need to ice, you know, 12 forwards and generally carry 13 or 14. So, yeah, I think there's definitely room for guys like Buma, um, some of the other young guys coming up to kind of say, you know what, that's the role I'm going to take. I'm going to be that energy player. And they might be able to get a job that perhaps they couldn't have by taking that role. Yeah. And as long as he is keeps up his physical play and blocking shots and playing well defensively, he'll always have a spot in the NHL. Yeah, no, I totally agree. He's becoming quite a good, I think, regular NHL player. I don't think there's many people that look at him and say, this is a guy that does not deserve to be in this league. I think that he's carved out a niche for himself. Yep. Um, Next guy on our list is the guy that we think is probably not going to be here at the end of the year, and that's Curtis Glencross. He's on pace for a career high. Um, If he continues at the same pace, he's on pace for 52 points, and 48 is his career high. If he can stay healthy, do you think Glencross beats his 48-point high? It'll be in the last few games of the season, and if he plays on a different team who he's lined up with. But, you know, he's been good for Glenn Cross it's just that I know that he's likely going to be wanting a payday contract which I don't blame him it's just that I don't think it's in the Flames best interest to spend north of five million a year for x number of years on a player that's a middle of the lineup guy He's got 26 points right now, so he needs to get uh, 49 to beat the career high. 48's the career high. I think if he stays here all year, he doesn't make it. I think that we're going to see if Glenn Cross stays here, his role gets diminished in favor of younger players, and he gets less ice time. But yeah, if he goes to a team that's going to make the playoffs where he's probably getting more quality ice time, even if he's playing on the third and fourth line, he's probably got line mates who can help him get some of those points. I think it's feasible that he maybe not gets to 52, but I think he could get right around his 48 number. Yeah, we'll see. He's been good this year for his level of play. It's just that financially it doesn't make a lot of sense for how the team's going to be looking payroll-wise in a few years. And I think this is also where you're starting to set a precedent for what you're paying guys. And I think if you set a precedent by paying Glenn Cross, like you said, north of you know, four and a half to five million, I think you're setting a bad precedent going forward. Yeah, because then you're going to get guys like Monaghan and Gaudreau that are both going to be going, well, where's my payday in a couple of years? And He's the third line center. Why is he making five million? Exactly. And winger, but yeah. Winger, yeah. So yeah, I think that the Flames don't really 
need Glenn Cross at this point. I th- I also think, and it's kind of weird to think about, but I think that if Glenn Cross leaves, that's really the last, to me, the last piece of the old guard with this team. I think even though there's guys that have been here longer, if you look at the key pieces that were the Flames for a while, Glenn Cross was part of that. And I think when Glenn Cross leaves here, it's really kind of the shedding of the last of the old guard for the Flames. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, the thing is is that the Flames have too many good prospects as well coming up that we are going to need roster spots for them because you can't have guys that are playing as well as Emile Poirier on the farm for years on end. Like, he's just too good. He's an NHL player right now. So... Uh, you know, it, we need the spots, and unfortunately, that means that you know a guy that is a somewhat of a fan favorite around here, he, he will have to go, and it, it sucks, but it's the way of things. And even if the Flames decide that they want more veteran depth in that role, I think that you could go out and shop the UFA market come July first and get a better deal for the same money. Well, look at uh, what the Flames spent on Mason Raymond in the offseason, and he's more or less the same kind of player as Glenn Cross. So, he's not as good, but close enough. Yeah, no, that's kind of what I was thinking, too. If you look at the Mason Raymond caliber, I don't know who's going to be a UFA this year. I don't have the list in front of me, but I'm sure you could go shopping and find, even if you're paying a little bit more, you might be able to get you know a similar player who's younger uh, for a little bit more money, but I think it would still be more cost-effective than re-signing Glenn Cross for anything north of, say, 4.5. Yeah. Like, you could go find somebody like a Matt Reed or something like that for cheap enough. Yeah. The last guy on our list here, another defenseman, is Dennis Weidman. Um, he's on pace to blow his career highs by quite a bit. Um, his career high is 13 goals. And he's currently got 10 goals. I don't know about his points, but um, if he's got 10 goals so far, I think he can definitely double or maybe even triple that by the end of the year. What do you think, Matt? Oh, yeah. So good to see Weidman. I think since he's been here, he's never really been. I know he was brought in to be kind of the top offensive defenseman, but I don't think he's ever really settled into that role. And this year we're starting to see a lot more from him. I think maybe he's being given more leash by the coaches. But yeah, if, I mean, if he can get you know twenty goals for a guy who's who's a second line uh, defenseman, I think that's really good. Yeah, and he was brought in here by and large to offset what uh, we lost from when we traded Dion Phaneuf. So the fact that he's putting pucks in the net, that's a good thing. And he didn't play particularly well the last couple of years on the offensive side of things. So it's good to see him rebound and play like he normally does. So just looking at his numbers versus Phaneuf's numbers this year, uh, Phaneuf has two goals, where Weidman has 10 goals. Phaneuf has 20 assists, where Weidman has 12 assists. So overall, they are tied for points at 22 at this stage. But yeah, I mean, if you're looking at a guy to replace the offensive side, at least this year, he's blowing Phaneuf out of the water Yeah, as far as goals go from the blue line. Uh, well, I find that goals are a lot more important than assists, amongst defensemen at least, because... Well, I'm kind of expecting defensemen to be able to get the assist. I mean, to me, their job is to move the puck up to the forwards. Exactly. And like it, last year, there was only 20 guys that had more than 10 goals. And so Weidman already having 10 puts him in an elite club, you know, compared to last year. So, yeah, you know, it's good. And, you know, what we were talking about earlier with Glenn Cross and Weidman, the fact they may or may not be Flames at the end of the year, I think that those guys being on on pace for career seasons and even Weidman, who will probably end up, no question, beating his career high of 13, makes the trade value all that much more. Oh, yeah. And instead of getting like a third round pick or worse 
you know, you might actually be able to get some good assets for them. Yeah, I mean, I've never made a trade at the NHL level, but I assume instead of almost making it seem like, hey, here's a slumping guy I want you to take off my hands, what will you give me for him? You almost get the look. Here's a guy who's at the peak of his career. I'm doing you a favor by making you this offer. What will you give me for this guy? Yeah, and a playoff team that, say, doesn't have a lot of offense from their defense, like, say, a Detroit, you might be able to pry a guy like Andreas Anathasio off of them for Weidman because he fills that need. And, you know, that would be a good thing to do. We'll see. But, uh, you know, you might be able to get a legitimately good player for a guy like Weidman instead of, hey, let's dump this guy for whatever we can get. Yeah, and I mean, even if it is a dump, I think it's just a different kind of way that you can spin it as a GM of, you know, here's a guy in the prime of his career versus someone like Setaguchi who, please take this guy, I need to get rid of the contract. Definitely. So that's that's all we got for guys who look like they're probably going to uh, have career years this year. Um, but, you know, even on a team like the Flames who are ninth, who are having a good season, one, two, three, four, five, six guys on those kind of paces to set career years for various stats, you generally don't see that many guys doing those kind of numbers on any team. No, and that's a big reason why the Flames are doing what they are. And hey, you forgot Johnny Gaudreau. He only had one goal all last season. Jeez. He better be able to beat that. (laughs) We should actually thank uh, a guy who goes by the name of Killer Carlson on the Calgary Puck forums for these numbers. These were him that did the research. So thank you, Killer Carlson, for this. Yeah, now if you're looking at career numbers... Technically, you couldn't look at Goudreau last year because he played one game. I don't think that counts as a career year, does it? Well, I, I'm setting the lo- the bar low, you know. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they actually acknowledge that in the dressing room. Hey, Johnny, you got your second goal. You got your career year this year. <laughs> um, who knows what's he had? He's actually at 31 points now, Goudreau. Yeah. 13 goals, 18 assists, 31 points. He's a plus 11. Yeah. So, yeah, having, having a good year. Yeah. He's okay. <laughs> I'd not be surprised if we see the Flames, I guess this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the Flames, I think, may clean up with hardware this year. I think that we've got a Norris candidate, I think we've got a Calder candidate, and I think we've got an Adams candidate. Yeah, I agree on all counts. So even if we don't get deep in the playoffs, I think that we may end up getting some hardware this year. Mm -hmm. Well, for comparison, Gaudreau actually has more points than Zach Parise and Martin St. Louis, so... There you go. That's, that's, I would not expect that. Wow. I would expect those guys to be up there quite a bit. I'm also starting to notice more Gudra jerseys in the stands here. Yeah. So have I ever since about the middle of November. That's when they started creeping in. And now it's getting close to Aginla levels. Well, and I went to the Islanders game after Christmas on the 2nd of January, and I think a lot of people must have got Goudreau jerseys for Christmas because there was like four sitting right in front of me, four in a row, and I was waiting by the the jersey press machine outside of Fanatic where they actually, you know, will customize a jersey, and I was talking to the guy, and he said, I have five Goudreaus lined up to do tonight. Yeah. So, yeah, it's you're right. It's almost on a Gidlin level. Yeah, that's good. He deserves the adoration that he's been getting. I was also talking to a guy who has an old Cami jersey, and he tried to rip the Camilleri off the back just so he can put Goudreau over it with the 13 still. Oh, I know that uh, that is something that some people are doing because the nameplate takes up the same amount of space either way. Yeah, well, I was was actually starting to count letters that way, and yeah, it's pretty close. You'd probably have to add a little bit more uh, space on one side, but it's pretty close. I don't know if all the letters are the same width or not, but... So, yeah, I no, I saw one guy who was doing that, and I thought that's kind of interesting. I never thought about doing that as recycling your Flames jerseys. So you mean I can uh, recycle my Darren McCarty number 25 jersey? You want to make it Bowleg? Yeah, it's good enough as it is. <laughs> it's the old style anyway, so it wouldn't fit. You know, I saw a guy behind the bench at the last game wearing the pedestal jersey. It's been a long time since I've seen somebody in the Dome wearing the, uh, what was at the time, the home white pedestal jersey. Oh, that's weird. I've seen a few of the red pedestals. Well, that's the thing. Back in the day, I never owned one because it was the away jersey. And now I almost wish I owned one just because, you know, red is the home color now. Yeah. 
So kind of a weird thing to see. Yeah, maybe the Fanatic should start selling some of our retro jerseys through the years, including the pedestals, because I'm sure that there are some fans that would buy some. Yeah, then you know what you start seeing? You start seeing pedestal jerseys with Goudreau on the back. Yeah, true. Historical accuracy right there. Well, bring them back for one game. (laughs) The Young Guns (laughs) 2.0. That I could actually see. I mean, seeing how all the other teams seem to be bringing back their jerseys, even teams like Anaheim and that sort of thing, I could could see that. Yeah, it'd be interesting for a game or two. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to it for a game or two. I wouldn't want it to be a third jersey or anything, but I wouldn't be opposed to it for a game here or there. Yeah, go through all the Flames jerseys of your... Yeah, I, you know, I think actually if they brought back the 04 jerseys, you'd see huge sales in those. Oh, yeah. Everybody loved those. Yep, none of these vertical stripes. Well, moving on with some Flames news. Um, good news for the Flames. Uh, Michael Backlund is cleared to play. He'll be in the lineup in the next game uh, coming up this week. So good to see him back. He hasn't even played a regular season game yet, has he? Uh, no, he played a bit early in the season and then dropped out right around where all the players seem to drop off. Okay. So, yeah, see my mind going back that far now is blurry between preseason and regular season. Yeah. He scored the overtime winner against Chicago. I think that was his only goal this year. So, okay. So he's expected to be back on Wednesday against the Red Wings. Yeah, and Mason Raymond will also draw back in. Granlund and uh, David Jones are going to be sitting. So it's good that they're bringing back them back and they have guys who are going to be sitting, but do you think this is going to cause any long-term roster moves? Do you think any of the guys who are up are going to get sent back to the farm because of this move? I would expect Granlund to go back to Adirondack. Just because he doesn't have to clear waivers and all that, and he can play top ice time down there. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. If I think Granlin would be the odd man out at center, and I'd rather he goes down there and gets you know 12 to 20 minutes a night than stay here as the 13th forward who's drawn in on the fourth line every two or three games. Yeah, and we've seen a lot from him, and that he's kind of like Backland more or less in how he plays like he's a good defensive player and he's decent offensively as well so like that's why i was saying that it might be feasible that the flames might trade backland later on just because of the fact that they have a very similar player in grandland yeah and you're right i mean they might choose to trade one or the other um we i think that grandland has a at least a year to go before we really know what we've got there so I wouldn't want the Flames to make that move this year? No, uh, there's no rush. It's just, you know, it, if there's a need, like say you can get a guy like Chalmerson or something from Chicago and they want Backlund, well, okay. It, you know, because it'll address a need. And, you know, you don't want to get rid of Backlund, but yeah. At least you know you got somebody in the prospect pool that can play more or less the same type of game. That's true. Yeah, I wouldn't look at Backlund as one of the untouchables on this team right now. But yeah, I think you're right. If the right deal comes along, he's movable, but it would have to be the right deal. Yeah, exactly. Like, you wouldn't be in a rush to, oh, we need a third round pick. Let's get rid of Backlund or anything no, like that. No, and I think Backlund is a guy who can help this franchise for the long term. So if I'm going to move him, I'm going to require the same back. Yeah, exactly probably a blue liner Mm -hmm. so i have always liked backland um same here i'm glad he's drawing back in the lineup because i like to watch him play and i think that an injury like this he has four points he has three assists and one goal so far in 11 games okay so he has played a good number of regular season games he's played 11 regular season this year but i think that a, a an injury that keeps you out as long as this one has can often derail a player it can really kind of stunt their development. So I'm glad we're getting him back in the lineup, and I think he's going to get some good minutes. Yeah. One thing that I would wish for Michael Backlund is him not getting injured right off the bat every year. It seems like he misses a month or so every November-ish, and, you know, it just derails everything. Michael Backlund getting hurt at the beginning of the season is almost as sure as Jerome McGinley having a slow start to the season when he was a flame. Yeah. It's one of those things that every year you just know it's going to happen. I don't know. 
it's disappointing because you'd like to see him actually break out and play like he can. It's just unfortunately he gets behind the eight ball. And like all the training he does in the off season gets, you know, wasted away because he's sitting too long. We've had a lot of Flames news, but of course we can't make it out of an episode of Fireside Chat without talking a little bit about the Oilers. They're doing some odd things since the uh, firing of Dallas Eakins. Seems like they're trying to dismantle their team, doesn't it, Matt? Yeah, you know, they wanted to get rid of Leon Dreisaitl and send him back to juniors, right? And they only have three centers beside that. And when Nashville waived Derek Roy, you would assume that you would just claim him and put him in the lineup. But instead, they trade Mark Arcobello, who's arguably their number two center this year, at least in terms of points, for Derek Roy. So you still end up needing a center at the end of the day, and Arcabello has a lot more points than Derek Roy had. And that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> see, I don't get that. We see that from time to time. It's like he was available for free. They don't claim him, and then they make a trade with that team like the day after. Why would you not just take the guy for free? Well, their thought was that... Uh, that they wanted to keep the contract space out available, but they only have like they only have like forty five contracts, so like it really doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But even in that case, maybe this is why you know I'm not an NHL GM or nowhere close to it. But to me, take Roy and then trade Zuc- you know trade the other guy for whatever you know trade Arcabello for a third. Yeah. But to me, it makes no sense to trade for an asset I could have had for free. I know. They're strange. And then they get rid of their, arguably their fourth best player in David Perron, who's young, he's only 26, and they get a fourth liner in return that's not in Rob Klinkhammer, and he's okay, but he's not that good. Like, he's already on his fourth team in two years. So... I don't know what they're and doing. Klinkhammer's 28, too. I mean, if you look at the other's roster, he's one of the senior guys in that roster. Yeah. They don't make any sense what they're doing at all. I th- I think the Perron move is going to be good for him. I think Pittsburgh's going to be a great market for him to play in. Oh, yeah. Like, anybody that gets out of Edmonton seems to rebound and play like they normally do. Any forward, really, would be, you know, that's of Perron's caliber getting traded to Pittsburgh... Oh, gee, I get to go play with Sidney Crosby or Evgeny Malkin. Gee, that's real hard luck there. (laughs) Yeah. So. No, yeah, I'm not really sure what the Oilers are doing. Like, I look at this and I think, okay, there's got to be another shoe to drop somewhere unless they're just in full tank mode. But I don't know what the other shoe is. Yeah, and, like, next year, they're going to need a top six forward like David Perron. And how are they going to get that? No free agents are going to sign with them unless they give them, like, $10 million. So, how do you trade for that? And the fact is, is that less than a year ago, they traded for Perron, and they gave up a lot more than they ended up getting. Well, that's it. I mean, the the deal to bring in Perron was a... It was a big deal for the Oilers, and I think it really established that this is a young guy we want to build our franchise around. Yeah, and they ended up gi- giving the Blues Magnus PRV and a second round pick that ended up being Ivan Barbashev, who, if he was Canadian, he probably would have been in the top 10 last year. And if you look at the pick that they're getting back from Pittsburgh, it's not going to be a low pick. I mean, it you know, it, it's going to be a very high pick in the draft, I think. Yeah, probably anywhere from like 24 to 30, depending on how Pittsburgh does in the playoffs. The Oilers could end up sandwiching the first round, picking first and 30th. Yeah. The only thing I can think of is the Oilers know they're going to be picking early in round two. So I'm thinking they might be acquiring that first to move it. Yeah, that's a possibility. Although, realistically, they really need to keep both and get some solid players in that organization. It's ridiculous. Like, you look at their lineup on in the NHL and their prospects, you would not know that this team has been rebuilding for eight years. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. And... You know, I thought I always thought Perron was a weird fit there because he wasn't an Oilers draft pick. Like they love to build around their own guys, 
And I wonder if maybe that was one of the reasons he was moved. It's just like, well, he's not one of us. Well, plus he was kind of critical of the organization. You know, legitimately, he was justified, but, you know, he can't have that. So dump him at the nearest corner. And I've also heard that the Oilers are also taking offers on Jeff Petrie and uh, Jordan Eberle. So it, the blowing up might not be limited to just Perron and Arcabello. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see wholesale change. I think that the Oilers are at the point where they have no choice right now but to make wholesale moves. Yeah, and honestly, if they... Started over by drafting McDavid or Eichel, you know, assuming they finished dead last, that then that would be a good piece to start around. And, you know, if you get rid of Hall and Eberly and, like, re-rebuild the rebuild that was rebuilt, then, you know... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, in order to make that work to me, you have to get rid of Hall and and or Everly and say, okay, we're not just adding to what we have. We are starting again. It's almost like when the Flames got rid of, you know, Iggy and Bo Meester, and it was the sign of a new time. I think that Edmonton almost needs to do the same by saying, okay, everly has gone and or Hall is gone. Now we're ready to move forward with this new guy at the center of the next iteration of the Oilers rebuild. Yeah, and Nugent Hopkins, he can stay because he's doing all right and he seems to work hard, so... Yeah. So you you approve them not trading of him. Yeah. If I was to keep one, he would be the guy. Everybody else. Pfft. And if the Oilers play their cards right, they can get good returns for those guys, like really good returns. Oh yeah. And any team would want access to Hall or Eberle. So I bet you'd get twenty nine bids on every guy. Yeah. And you know, like I could see a team like Anaheim lining up for both of those guys. Because they have a ton of prospect depth already in their system that where the Oilers lack. So, And Anaheim's also not afraid to trade their first. We've seen that in the past. No, exactly. And like you could see a trade where, say, even a guy like Cam Fowler goes for a guy like Hall, plus other assets from Anaheim going to Edmonton. Because uh, the Ducks have Sammy Vatanen, who's come out of nowhere to be one of the top point getters in the NHL for defensemen. So it might make Fowler expendable in their eyes. I could also see, and I think they'd have a harder time pulling off, but I could see the Blues being very interested in Hall and or Everly as well. Yeah, I agree. I think they'd both fit in very well in the Blues system. Yeah especially Eberly, but again, it's a matter of what do you get back. And looking at the Blues lineup, there's not a lot that they'd probably want to give back. Yeah, that's why I was figuring the Ducks would be the more likely candidate just because they have a ton of good pieces in their system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Edmonton might even just be looking for draft picks. They might say, you know what, take these guys, give me some picks over the next couple of years, and we're going to start this again. Yeah, well, like... Uh... The Ducks also have the benefit of two very, very good starting goaltenders in Frederick Anderson and John That's Gibson. True. So both of which Edmonton could use. Exactly. So there is a scenario where, you know, if you did Hall and Eberly, you could see a massive trade that would actually work between those two teams. I think if either of those guys gets traded this year, it becomes one of those monumental trades that will be talked about probably for the rest of the calendar year. I think for either guy to move out of Edmonton, it's going to be such a big return that it's going to, I don't want to say change the whole league, but it's going to be one of those things that could put another team much more in contention and could really change Edmonton's outlook going forward. Yeah, I agree. I think it could be the trade of 2015. Yeah, and they really do need to. Like Enough's enough. They need to get their head out of their posterior and start figuring out how to play hockey again. And the coach seems to have got them playing at least somewhat competently, which is not something that could be said often for Edmonton. So it's frustrating to see a team be that bad. So I'm hoping that they find a way to turn the corner. And even if that does mean that they end up getting Connor McDavid or Jack Eichel, so be it. 
it's one guy. And you, uh, you, so one guy does not make a, a Stanley Cup team. No. And it might help them become good again, but they still need to flesh out the rest of their organization. Yeah, I, I think that if you know if you get rid of those guys, you get the return that it would take to get rid of Hall and Eberle, and you bring in McDavid or Eichel, I think that the Oilers are back on track to have the pieces needed for an actual rebuild this time. Yeah, and it, it was unfortunate that they did start their rebuild when they did because those particular drafts where they did select first overall were probably the weakest in the last decade. But you gotta start somewhere. Yeah, uh, it would also help if they actually got anybody out of the second round or beyond, as well. Like they would have actually been better off in the last ten years if they just traded all their second and ra- through seventh round picks for other players and assets. So you're saying they need Daryl Sutter as a GM because he was a guy that loved to move our second round pick. Well, when you have terrible scouting you're just throwing the assets away and like even if you look at their draft last year they drafted three overage guys which that usually does not turn out so <laughs> speaking of the david perron trade and former oilers uh magnus prv prv svensson was on waivers this week and i was surprised the 29 teams all passed on him and then that nobody made a crappy deal for him the day after he came off waivers is that a guy that you would have taken if you were the Flames? Uh, not in the Flames' current situation, just because the Flames have so many forward prospects and NHL forwards. But any team that was lacking in that either department, I would have. Why not? You never know. He was a good player before he got to Edmonton. See, and that's exactly why I think I probably would have taken him. Looking at the farm, I think that... There's room for another forward. I mean, we've got Setaguchi sitting down there. I think I would have taken PRV's 23. And if nothing happens, you can always try to deal him again or keep him here as an AHL depth guy. But I think that a good development system like the Flames, there's definitely an opportunity for him to go up. True. It's just you get into a numbers game there. Yeah, no, that's true. But, you know, depending on how badly you want the guy, you can always figure out the numbers. It's not like we're at 49 contracts right now. Yeah. And it's not like he's that expensive. No. And at least uh, with the Flames keeping their roster spots open, maybe they can target a couple of the good NCAA defensemen that are coming up at the end of the year. Well, and that's an area the Flames have had success. I mean, we've seen, especially over the past handful of years when Feaster was here and since he's left, we've seen success targeting NCAA players. Mm -hmm. More forwards than defensemen, but we've seen... The Flames go out and get those guys um, that other teams don't seem to put that kind of value on the NCAA. Yeah, and uh, there's a few guys this year, so hopefully the Flames can snag a couple of them. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, but I think that part of that's going to depend on how some of the NCAA guys in our system do as well. I think that if you're a college guy and you're saying, yeah, all the college guys in the Flames system are developing very well, I think I'm more likely to join that system as well. Mm-hmm. And you see guys like uh, Hanowski, who we talked to in the off season. You see guys like, um, so you know, some of the other guys that we have, guys like Van Brabrand, who all told us that they're still going to school, and you know, taking their Agostino, all told us that they're still going to school and taking classes. And I think that if you see the Flames are open to that and have a way to work with that, that becomes much more appealing as well. Mm-hmm. Well, that way they get to finish up their degree and all that. Yeah, and if the Flames almost have a program and they have enough guys here doing that, they start to get to know how that works. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a selling point as well, especially for mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So that way they're not stunting their education in case the NHL doesn't work. That was the whole thing with Goudreau, right? His parents didn't want him to go pro because they wanted him to finish his education. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, you'll see some guys who that becomes much more of a much more of a selling point there. Maybe not the whole thing, but it's one factor to consider that might give us a leg up over somebody else. Yep. Well, Matt, uh, I think it's probably time to wrap it up. We have three games this week for the Flames. Uh, Wednesday, the Red Wings are in town, and we see the return of number 11 to the to the lineup. Um, we will see 
Um, the Flames then play your favorite, your second favorite team, the Panthers, on Friday, and they cap off the week with a back-to-back against the Canucks on Saturday. Six points on the table. How are we going to do? Eh, I'm going to say four. Four of the six? You know, the last time I predicted the Flames were going to win them all, they lost them all. Then the next week, they won them all. So, you know, who knows? Do you, do you think that, do you care to speculate which games they're going to get four out of or just four of the six? I think they'll beat Florida and Vancouver. So you think that they're going to, you think that they're going to fall to the Red Wings? Yep. I, I like Detroit. Their system's quite good. So, and Jimmy Howard always seems to play really well against us for whatever reason. I think it's going to be tough to win both games in the back to back. That's my only worry. Um, but yeah, I think that I also will go with four points. I'm going to say that we're going to win the two home games this week. I think that you're right. Howard always finds a way to play well against us, but I think that we can find a way, even if it's an overtime win against the Red Wings. And I think that they're going to end up uh, beating the Panthers, even though the Panthers are hot right now and looking good. I think that they're going to beat the Panthers. Yeah, and it was a good signing for the Florida Panthers to lock up Nick Bukestad for six years. It similar contract to TJ Brody, so... Yeah, no, that was... I saw that come down the wire. He's pretty much the only guy on Florida that I would really like to have on the Flames. Yeah, no, I, I think he'd work really well here with this system and this kind of development system as well. Yeah. Still, Anytime you get a six foot six center that's fast and can score goals, yeah, that's not gonna <laughs> get traded anytime soon. No, and you know, if he's six foot six, that kind of, you know, brings the average height back up on the team too. Yeah. If he were to come here. So we're both thinking four points this week. We'll see how we do when we uh reconvene next Monday. Yeah. Have a great week. It's good to be back, and I'm looking forward to a great twenty fifteen for this team. I hope everybody had a safe and fun holiday season and back at it for 2015. Go Flames Go! Go Flames Go! Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.